This first slide, if you've been to any of our presentations before, is something that you may have seen. It's the four foundations of success, and these are critical requirements for successful gardening, uh, which includes propagation. As I talk about propagating, I'll include information about what's needed in each of these four areas for success. We refer to these practices as good cultural care. So how does propagation benefit me? Listed first is that it is a sustainable gardening practice. And this is something that's getting a lot of attention and we're hearing it more and more. And a lot of people might not know exactly what sustainable means. And it's very simple. It means that the activity can be maintained indefinitely with minimal impact on the environment. Sustainable landscaping practices are those that not only save money by saving energy, water, and time, they help the environment. The biggest benefit for me is that propagation can be done anywhere, by anybody, and at any budget level. It can be done indoors, in backyards, balconies, on the windowsill, and I hope that you all find many benefits uh, for propagation. So there are basically two types of propagation. Sexual propagation is accomplished um, through pollination with two parents that create seeds and spores. So you get the characteristics of two different plants, um, whether they're this exact same plant or plants within the same family. Asexual propagation is accomplished with only a single parent by cloning. So that means that the plants that are propagated through asexual propagation are exactly the same as the parent plant. There are different methods of propagation, and I will talk mostly about taking cuttings and separation and division, but I'll also provide basic background on layering and grafting without as much detail. Grafting and budding are actually covered in a separate presentation that Master Gardeners provides that gives an excellent um, in-depth overview of what they are all about. And more information on all methods is available in books in your library and through online. So this picture is a picture of a tender, short-lived perennial it's often grown as an annual. It's been rooted in water. And I don't have the name for it because I can't remember what it is. That highlights the dangers of not labeling your propagation efforts. So labels are very important. But once planted, I know it'll be beautiful and I'll probably figure out what it is at that point. Propagation is a great way to carry annuals and other tender perennials through the winter so that they may die down outside, but you'll have new plants to get started when the spring arrives. It's also a really great way to fill in your landscaping with those plants that you love. But don't be disappointed if all of your propagation efforts are not successful. Mine are not always successful, and I don't think anybody's are. Whether you do something that isn't quite the right way, or the plant is just rebellious. They don't always take. So what you wanna do is propagate multiple cuttings of the same plant so that at least some of them will make it. I also wanna give you a note here about patents. Patents are a way that plant developers protect their work by restricting unauthorized propagation until that patent expires. If you don't know if a plant that you have in your yard is protected by a patent, it's very easy to look it up online. Just enter the name of your plant and the word patent, and it'll give you information about it. And with that information, it will include a filing date. And patents expire 20 years after the date that the patent has been filed. So once those 20 years are up, it's free game. So there are different propagation methods that are used for different plants. 
and some plants can be propagated with different methods. I'll describe the different types of plants and the different methods and what works for what plant. Pictured here is a rose, succulents, hydrangea, and croton, and cuttings from each one of these plants will end up the same as the parent plant. So new plants can be created from either stems or leaves or roots. Stem cuttings are the most widely used. They tend to be the most successful. Leaf cuttings can also be very successful. Parent plants, those plants that you take your cuttings from, should be healthy, free of disease and pests. And the best part of a stem for a cutting is usually where the plant is actively growing. That's where the plant has the most growth hormone located. For most cuttings, you'll want to avoid new growth with buds or flowers on them. And this bottle brush in this picture has a flower on it only because I needed that flower to be able to tell what it was. But otherwise I would have taken a cutting with no flower on it, or if all of the, cut, the stems have flowers, I would cut the flower off before doing the propagation work. The tools and supplies that you need for propagation are very simple, and you probably have most of them already available in your home. Um, labels and pen and pencil, we've already talked about. You'll need a sharp cutting tool to make a clean cut. You don't wanna leave jagged ends or, or damage that stem. And it's a good idea to sterilize your, your scissors or whatever you're using before and after cutting each separate plant. You'll also want clean and sterilized pots. A good way to sterilize both your tools and your pots is to blend one part bleach to nine parts water and wash well in that and that'll take care of the sterilization. You'll also want to build a mini greenhouse. This is very important for creating moisture in, and it replaces water that your cutting will lose through transpiration. Transpiration is just water evaporation through the leaves of the plant. Um, rooting medium is a non-soil mix that you'll need and then rooting hormone. And I'll give you some more information about those last three items. So for a rooting medium, the simplest and the one we're most familiar with is just plain water. Beyond that, we have our non-soil planting mediums. They should be sterile. That means no living organisms in them. Low or no fertility, no, no nutrients. Good aeration. Um, it needs to be really well draining. And no heavy soils, which means that you don't want to use soil from your garden. Um, the first thing that you can use is 100% perlite or 100% vermiculite or equal parts of each of those. Perlite is a white volcanic glass. Vermiculite is a light colored, multicolored um, rock, which is made from large mineral crystals. At our garden in Walnut Creek, our demonstration garden, our propagators use 100% perlite. Both of these materials are highly porous. They're able to hold the water in the soil. Perlite is harder when you're comparing them. Vermiculite tends to hold more moisture and keeps it available in the soil longer, but both of them are very good choices. Another option for your uh, rooting medium is equal parts of sand, perlite or vermiculite with coconut coir, peat moss or potting soil. Coconut coir is fairly new on the market, at least it is to me, I hadn't heard about it until recently. It's purchased in bricks and they're sold in different weights. They do need to be rehydrated. And the way that that is done is that you cover a brick in warm water in a bucket and you'll add four or five gallons of water 
per five kilo, which is equal to 11 pounds of brick. Then you allow the water to absorb for at least 15 minutes. Once it's fully absorbed, fluff the cocoa coir up until it resembles the ideal soil-like consistency. Peat moss can also tend to dry out and need to be rehydrated. And you just add water until it's absorbed and it also avoid, uh, resembles the ideal soil-like consistency. The last rooting medium option is ready-made seed starting mix. So rooting hormone is very important for most propagation efforts with cuttings. It provides for better and faster rooting, but you don't want to use it for soft, fleshy stems like geraniums, and you don't need to add it to water, and you also don't need to add it to cane cuttings, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. In general, the powder forms of root hormone are less effective than liquid when they're applied at the same concentration, but both really work well, so either one is a great option. You just want to make sure that you follow the directions on the package for dilution if it's a liquid and for using the powder. It's also recommended that you put a small amount of the hormone into a separate container. Don't dip your um, cutting directly into your entire bottle because you want to avoid contamination in case that cutting is diseased or has insects of any kind. To use the rooting hormone, you'll dip the basal, which is just another word for the bottom of the cutting into the hormone. The cutting should not be wet. Moisture will cause powder to clump and it can further dilute the liquid. You'll want to lightly tap the cutting to remove any excess powder before inserting the rooting medium into the pot. So these pictures show how very simple it is to make your mini greenhouses using supplies that you already have on hand at home. These are made of plastic bags with sticks or straws holding them up and away from the plants. And they're also made with soda bottles where the bottom has been removed and the top is left off so that air can get in. If using plastic baggies, you'll want to punch holes in them so that you get some airflow. The plastic fruit and vegetable containers that you get at the grocery store also make great pot greenhouse combinations, and I show them in a later slide. Plastic is recommended over glass because glass can get too hot, but if you don't anticipate that extra heat, you can try with glass if that's all that you have. Be sure to poke those holes in the plastic bags Leave the tops off the bottles to let air in and make sure that the bottom of your pot or your plastic container has holes in them to excess for what excess water drainage. So pictured here is water to show the importance of well hydrated plants before taking your cuttings. A, sylvia, a salvia leucantha which is a Mexican sage bush, and an abutilon or flowering maple. So when you're taking your cuttings, you want to be sure to water really well the day before, or at least one hour before cutting. Try to avoid the heat of the day if you can. Early morning or late afternoon really are the best times. Take a four to six inch cutting from undamaged tip growth cutting at an angle to promote more roots. And you can see on this picture that these um, cuttings are cut at an angle on the bottom. You'll also want to cut about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch above a leaf node and allow for at least high, three higher nodes so that you have at least two that will be below and one or more that will be above the rooting medium when you put it in. Cut or break off all leaves from the lower two inches, at least two nodes worth, 
taking care not to damage the stem. Remove any flowers and buds and cut large leaves in half. Now on this abutilon and the sage, I don't consider those leaves to be too big, but if I did, I would just cut the bottom half of them off. And the reason that you're doing that is so that the plant is not using as much energy to keep those leaves fresh. It's putting its energy into creating roots and new growth. You wanna make sure to plant as soon as possible after you take your cutting. If you're unable to plant right away, store it in the fridge with moist paper towels and air within a sealed plastic bag, or you can put it directly in water to plant a day or so later when you can. The moist paper towel and the plastic bag are also good tools to take with you when you're traveling around and you might find something you wanna take a cutting of that will keep it as fresh as possible until you can get it home. So in order to root a cutting, your medium must be damp, not wet, filled almost to the top, and you'll want to tamp down the medium to remove excess air. Um, punch a hole for each cutting to insert it without damaging it or scraping off the rooting hormone. And you can use a stick for that. Um, chopsticks, plant stakes, and bamboo skewers are great tools. Plant at least two nodes and try not to hit the bottom. Don't plant it upside down. The roots do develop more easily from the bottom node. And sometimes they won't root at all if you plant it upside down. You can use your angled cut as a guide and water until it drains through the bottom in order to settle the medium around the cutting. Then you'll want to enclose it in a greenhouse to increase the humidity and keep the plastic off the cuttings with sticks. Poke the holes to allow airflow. And remember, cuttings don't have roots, so the humidity is really needed to prevent wilting, scorching, leaf, leaf drop, and death. Um, place the cuttings in bright, indirect light, but not direct sunlight. What I have pictured here are some African violet leaves that I've taken cuttings of, and they are in plastic, fruit, and vegetable containers. You can use any size as long as it's deep enough for whatever your cutting is going to be and when it grows. And you can see in the front of the left-hand picture, the African violets that I cut off, they are cut at an angle at the base of the stem, about leaving about a quarter inch. And then the top halves of the leaves are cut off and they are inserted into the rooting medium up to the top of the stem, just below where the leaf starts. And then the, the rooting medium is tamped down to remove excess air. This next picture is my cutting of the purple heart. And you can see that roots have developed really well on the one cutting. It was a very long cutting, you may remember from the earlier slide. And so what I decided to do was cut it into three parts and the other two pieces I will root in rooting medium. I did root this in water. And although water is the easiest rooting method, method with the least equipment needed, plants may fail when they're rooted in water. And the reason for that is that they don't need to struggle to find the water. So their roots tend to be smaller and more fragile, whereas roots that are rooted in uh, rooting medium are thicker and sturdier because they are more, it's more difficult for them to find and take in water. So you might want to take one extra step before transplanting your, your cutting that's been rooted in water. If you simply want to pot it up, which means put it into a pot or put it into a larger pot than it's currently in, you can do that. And you would fill a pot with a bit of soil, hold the cutting with the roots below the rim of the pot, 
Gently fill the rest of the pot with soil while you fan the roots out so that they're not all clumped together and then water it thoroughly. However, the extra step is to do it slow and steady. And that's what I have pictured here. You take your water container, which is this glass, and you remove half of the liquid. Then you fill that half with a combination of potting soil, peat moss, or coconut coir, and perlite, vermiculite, or sand. Then you gently put your cutting into that uh, same container, being very careful not to remove the, the um, roots or damage the roots by inserting it too harshly. And so you would leave it that way and replace a little bit of the water every day with a little bit more soil until it's mostly or all soil. And then you can pot it up into a pot. Do not apply any fertilizer until you do your final planting. And if you do need to handle the cutting to keep it centered, either in that water container or in the pot that you transplant it into, hold it by the new growth at the top so that you're not damaging the roots. So pictured here is Salvia Mexicana limelight. It was rooted successfully in 10 days outside during the summertime. So you, but you do want to make sure you take care of your cuttings after they are in their rooting medium. Um, they can't just be ignored and wait for the, the roots to form. If you do decide to leave them outdoors, protect them from direct sunlight, wind, rain and sudden temperature changes. Maintain an even moisture. You don't want to overwater. You don't want to let the leaves dry out. Keep an eye on the condensation in the greenhouse. You want to make sure that there's good airflow and moisture and the cuttings aren't rotting or drying out. You can check your root growth to see how your plant is doing by gently tugging on the stem. If you meet with resistance, then the rooting has begun. Some cuttings will root quickly in four to six weeks or 10 days as shown here. For Scythia only takes four to six weeks, generally speaking. Some cuttings take four months like rhododendron and some cuttings take all winter and through the spring for your hardwood cuttings. And we'll talk about those more later. To see if your cutting is ready for transplanting, Remove it from the rooting medium and replace it if, not, if it's not ready. So you can see in this picture that the entire soil area was well rooted and it doesn't need to be put back into that container. It's ready to pot up into a bigger container or into its permanent spot. Once the roots are ready, to be transplanted, you'll know when they're at least one inch long and they're sturdy. At that point, you'll want to remove the greenhouse to let in drier air, move it to a brighter light and monitor it to make sure that it's still um, staying healthy. Then you can pot it up or you can plant it into the garden. When it's well rooted and you transplant it to the garden, you can add an all-purpose fertilizer according to the directions and keep an eye on it to see if it needs anything special, such as a temporary shade cloth, mulch, or frost protection. Do keep notes to document your successes. A garden journal is really a handy thing. Um, success may vary be due to your rooting medium, due to what hormone you use, how much you apply, environmental factors like the time of year you took the cutting or simply the cutting didn't want to root and you can't figure out why. Based on those, adjust your methods and you'll gain more success over time. Herbaceous perennials are some of the easiest plants to propagate. These are plants that die down to the ground each year but the roots remain alive and send up new top growth each year. 
These cuttings may root well in water as well as in a rooting medium. For them, you would want to cut it, the new growth any time during the growing season. Older woody stems tend to root more slowly or may not root at all for you. Rooting hormone may not be needed for herbaceous perennials during the spring and summer, and you don't want to use them for the hormone for soft, fleshy stems. Pictured here are herbaceous perennials, rosemary, salvia hot lips, dianthus, also called pinks, and coleus. So softwood cuttings are taken from deciduous or evergreen woody shrubs. You would take cuttings of the soft new growth, usually in mid spring to early summer before the wood has matured. Shoots that work best for these cuttings are those that have some flexibility and bend, but they would break if they're bent further. Um, a good example of that is to take the stem and bend it into a horseshoe. But if you bend it any further than that horseshoe, it could crack or break completely. You want to avoid weak, thin interior stems and vigorous, thick, woody ones and stems that have flowered. If you have to take a cutting from a stem that's flowered, remove that flower because it takes up more energy from the plant. These typically root easily in two to five weeks. And I want to give you a note on abutilons. I love abutilons. They come in all different colors and shapes and sizes. And those cuttings can be taken any time of year. And you can have great success simply by planting that cutting immediately in the soil in your garden. I have not had success trying to root them in water, but I have success had success planting them immediately in a pot outdoors or in the soil. Rooting hormone may not be needed for these softwood cuttings during the spring and summer, but it is recommended to help with the root growth. Pictured here, we have a lilac, hydrangea, forsythia, and a butylon. So here are some pictures of a rose cutting. And this rose was, was uh, propagated by a friend of mine in just four months, and it was highly successful. To do a rose cutting, you would want to cut six to eight inch sized pencil sized stem that in this case has partially hardened with a flower or a finished bloom. So that is an exception to the no bloom rule. And you want at least four nodes and at least two leaves on top above your cutting. Another difference is that you want to trim the bottom flat just below a node and cut the top at an angle just above a leaf. Trim the leaves to half size if they're large and you'll want to immediately cut float the cuttings in water until you get them into the house or get them planted. So carry a bucket around with you for that. Insert the cutting into rooting hormone and water it from the bottom by soaking the pot in the sink. Cover the cuttings with a plastic greenhouse to keep the humidity high and the cutting hydrated. You want it moist, but not wet. Top growth does not mean that there are roots yet. And it is okay if the leaves yellow and fall off. They will get new growth. Roots typically begin appearing in about two weeks and the cuttings typically develop good top growth in roots in six months. Four months in this case was great. And that's when they can be planted in a permanent location. So semi-hardwood cuttings are cuttings of new growth from woody broadleaf evergreen shrubs, usually in the late summer, which is mid-July to early September. After the rapid summer growth, when the wood is firm but not fully matured. These typically root in four to six weeks and they typically take the same rooting instructions that we've been talking through. Pictured here is a holly, a pittosporum, camellia, and azalea. So cuttings of woody stems are hardwood 
They are, you want to cut the previous season's growth. There, it's a narrow leafed evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs during winter dormancy. The cut, cuttings for hardwood is a more difficult and different rooting process. Cuttings should be four to six inches in length. You want the midsection of a stem. This is a difference from the other instructions. The tip and the base of the branch are removed so the cutting has no new or older wood on it. The cutting should be moderate size and vigor to be best. Cut an angle on the top like you do the rose, and that's to prevent water from settling on it if you put it outdoors, and cut it that angle just above a single or pair of buds. Make a straight cut just below a single or a pair of buds on the bottom. You should use a different meat rooting medium also. Four parts of a peat-free potting mix to one part perlite. And all potting mixes do have the ingredients on the bag so you can see exactly what is in it. You'll want to dip the basal end, which is the bottom end of the cutting in a rooting hormone and plant it in a one gallon pot with your rooting medium, inserting five to seven cuttings around the edge of the pot, leaving just one bud or pair of buds exposed. Water the cuttings, again moist, but not too wet in order to settle the medium. Place the pot in an unheated location with some light. A window in the garage is a great place and keep it there throughout the winter and into spring. Keep the soil fairly dry during the coldest months and increase the watering as the days get warmer. Move the pot outside to a partially shaded spot after the last frost. There should be some shoot growth by mid spring. You can also leave the cuttings outdoors if you have a protected spot like the side of your house and if you don't get hard frosts. So these are going arcane like stem cuttings, typically tropical plants, so mostly house plants. And you want to cut the stems into sections containing one or two nodes. If you look at this picture on the right hand side, the nodes are the sections between those white lines going across the stem. So this has one, two, three, four, five, six nodes showing in the picture. You would dust the ends of the cutting with a fungicide or activated charcoal in order to guard it against excess water, bacteria, fungus, and rot, and allow it to dry for several hours. No rooting hormone is needed for these cane cuttings. You would lay the stem cuttings on their sides with about half of the cutting below the rooting medium surface and an eye facing upward. And on that right side example, you can see two eyes. They are the little white dots right above um, the delineating section of a node. So you could actually make two cuttings out of this section with those eyes pointing upwards. And then you would pop the cutting uh, into a more permanent spot when roots and new shoots appear. Succulent cuttings are very popular and are an easy plant to propagate. You can propagate from either leaves or from stems. If you're propagating from a leaf, the base of the leaf should be intact. It shouldn't have broken off and damaged that end, end of the uh, leaf. You can use a leaf that has fallen off, or you can gently remove a leaf by hand. Cut a stem with sharp scissors as you would other cuttings. For both leaves and stems, allow the cut end to dry or scab over, which is about one day for a leaf and a couple of days for a stem. Um, it may take longer, it may not take quite that long, but I would give them at least that long. Remove the bottom leaves from the stem the way you would other cuttings. You can use rooting hormone to help with rooting on succulents 
but generally it's not needed. Use regular potting mix or succulent mix as your rooting medium and place the leaf or stem cut side down into the medium or a leaf can be laid on its side on top of the medium. I've had the most success by actually planting them. Mist them with water a couple of times a week or when they're dry and make sure not to overwater. So pictured here on the left-hand side are different kinds of succulent cuttings. Some are leaves, some are stems, and some are offsets. Um, you can see the differences. The middle picture is a jade plant that my daughter had given me, and she propagated it. And for some reason, it did not like my house. The minute it got here, it fell apart. And I took those pieces of it and I put them into rooting medium and they actually took off. They've, they've rooted and they've actually got new growth on them. So I'm very excited about that. On the right hand side are some leaves that fell off of another succulent that I have. So I dried them out and I put those leaves into the rooting medium. I pulled one of them out gently using a spoon so I wouldn't disturb the bottom and you can see the roots growing on the end there. And as soon as I took that picture, I put it back in with its fellow leaves and it's growing. So after cuttings, we're talking about plant division and separation. And this can be done on herbaceous perennials and on multi-branched woody plants by dividing the crown. The crown is also called a plant base. The crown of the plant is the area where the stems join the roots. Roots grow down and the stems grow up from the plant crown. To divide herbaceous perennials, you do it based on when they flower. Spring bloomers can be divided in late summer to fall and late summer to fall bloomers can be divided in early spring before the new growth begins. You would divide by gently lifting the plants using a trowel or shovel and remove enough soil from the roots to see those, those roots. If the stems and roots are not overlapping, gently pull the plants apart as this picture demonstrates. If there is overlapping, use a sharp knife to cut the crown into pieces with shoots and roots. You want an adequate supply of each on each piece of that crown. To, to divide large old crowns, discard the older center portion and create new plants, replant the vigorous new shoots that are at the edges of the clump. If you want to divide a multi-branched woody plant, you would want to do it during the dormant season, which is the winter if it's evergreen. Trim the shoots, so that the energy isn't going into those, it's going into the um, growth, and dig up sections of the plant and tear or cut them apart. You'll want to trim the damaged roots as needed, and you may need to divide it with a shovel or hatchet, depending upon how sturdy and hard that um, crown is. Many of the plants that we grow in our gardens have specialized stems and roots. And the primary function of these specializations is food storage for the plant. But a second, secondary function is asexual propagation. And they are propagated through separation and division. Regularly separating and dividing these plants every three to five years will promote larger and bigger flowers more and larger flowers. So it really is something that you'll want to do. The first type shown here is bulbs and that includes tulips, daffodils, garlic, amaryllis. True bulbs are layered on the inside much like an onion is layered and most have a protective tunic layer covering the outside of the bulb. Corns are very similar to bulbs and some examples are gladiola, crocus, and freesia. Corms have a solid base of a stem. It's round with a basal plate, basal meaning bottom, like a bulb, 
but it's flatter in appearance. Runners and stolens are very similar. All runners are stolens, but not all stolens are runners. Runners are plants like strawberry plants, spider plant, and the jasmine. A slender stem forms new plants at its node. Plantlets may be rooted while they're still attached to the parent, or they can be detached and placed in a rooting medium. Um, stolons are, are plants like ajuga and mint. And these also have horizontal above ground stems, but they root and produce new shoots when they touch soil. So they start rooting pretty soon. Rhizomes are like your iris, canna, asparagus, and bamboo. They have below ground stems as opposed to above ground. And those stems can be cut into sections. Each section will need one lateral bud or eye, and you should be able to see that on the stem. Offsets, some examples of those are bromeliads, pineapple, hens and chicks, and many cacti. And offsets occur on plants that have rosette stems. They look like little roses that form new shoots at the base or in a leaf axle. And a leaf axle is the upper or narrow angle between a leaf stalk and the stem from which that axle is growing or that leaf is growing. You want to sever the new shoots after they develop their own roots. Tuberous stems and tuberous roots have bulbous shaped stems or roots for their food storage. Stems examples are cyclamen, caladium, tuberous begonias, gloxinias, and potatoes. So think about what a potato looks like when you're thinking about tuberous stems. The eyes are nodes and they have one or more buds. On tuberous roots, it's the root that gets bulbous. And some examples are daylilies, dahlias, peonies, and sweet potatoes. Tuberous roots are like roots, but they have no nodes and the buds are present at the stem end. Just today, we put up an excellent short video on how to propagate sweet potatoes on our website. So if you go to ccmg.ucanr.org and look on the right-hand side column, there will be a link to our YouTube channel and you can see how to propagate sweet potatoes as well as other videos that are available. So the next type of propagation is layering. And layering is a process that develops new roots on a stem while the stem is still attached to the parent plant. And once it's rooted, the stem can be detached to become a new plant growing on its own root system. Layering does often occur naturally when flexible branches touch the ground and take root on their own, like the root ropes, raspberry bush. And there are six common types of layering that are shown here. Air and simple layering are the most popular types. And the method used depends on the part of the parent plant and the age of the plant tissue that's going to be used. For air layering, it's especially useful for house plants that have grown too tall and have dropped their lower leaves, like a Diffenbachia. So if you have a plant like that, a cane-like structure, you can use air, air layering to grow roots at the base of where the bottom leaves are. And then once you have those, you can cut off the stem that is left and propagate it as cuttings like we talked about. Um, air layering is also used for shrubs, trees, and vines like azaleas, camellias, and wisteria. Air layers are usually made in the spring on wood of the previous season's growth, or sometimes in the late summer with partially hardened shoots. The shoots used should be pencil-sized or slightly larger, and roots usually develop several weeks after the layer is made, and it can then be transplanted. 
Simple layering and tip layering are very similar. They're done by arching a supple shrub stem that's up to two years old, or just the tip of that stem to the ground and holding it in place with a U-shaped wire or staple. When securing the stem to the ground, you'll want to damage or wound it slightly at the bottom of the curve by pushing on the wire or staple until you feel or hear a crack and then weigh it down. That way that provides a place for the roots to grow from. This is best done in early spring when the shrub is dormant on one year old shoots. Some broadleaf evergreens may be done later if the in the season if after the current season's growth has hardened such as rhododendrons and hollies. Compound or serpentine layering is when the stem is alternately covered and exposed along its length, producing more plants per shoot. And each exposed portion of the stem needs at least one bud on it to develop a new shoot. This works well for plants with flexible stems such as vines, Again, you will need to wound the stem at the bottom of each curve that's under the soil. Trench layering, which I don't have a picture of here, is very similar to the serpentine layering, but the stem is covered all along its length in a trench with multiple wound points for growth. Mound layering works really well with multiple basal shoots like quince and crepe myrtle. You would cut the plant back to one inch above the ground in the dormant season, then mound soil or a coarse organic mulch over the emerging shoots in the spring to encourage rooting. When roots develop, cut the buried shoots from the parents. To find out if that, those plants are ready for separation, dig slightly around the stem to see if roots have developed and probe gently to determine how extensive the root system is. Only remove the new plant from the parent when the root system is well developed. Be careful not to remove a peg too soon or the springiness of the stem could lift it out of the soil. I have a crepe myrtle in my yard that um, is no longer in a good place. It's now more shaded than it was when it was planted. So I am hoping to be able to create more crepe myrtles next season with the mound layering. Uh, I think it's a little bit too late in this season to do that. So here are some pictures of newly layered plants. On the left is an example of air layering. You can see that it's been done on this tree branch where the branch has been wounded and a bandage. A uh, special bandage has been placed around it. The roots will grow from the bottom of the bandage. And when it's a good root system, then it can be detached. The middle is a mound layering example of ivy. Um, and the right hand side is an example of tip layering where it's a philodendron that is still attached to that tip. And you can see that philodendron plant on the left-hand side, and the tip has been emerged in, uh, submerged in uh, rooting medium to grow a new plant. But like all newly planted cuttings, newly layered plants need a little special care. Once they are removed from the parent and potted up, Prune the plant to reduce the leaf area to one third of its size, not just a single leaf, but the whole leaf area. Um, that is to um, help concentrate energy from the plant into growing new roots and growing more leaves. Plants should be shaded lightly during the first season and the shading can be removed after the first winter. Plants then can then be moved to their permanent location. So grafting and budding is a great propagation method that's done to improve features of a plant, such as creating the vigor of a wild plum tree with the sweet large fruit of a farmer's market plum. With grafting, you can also grow different fruits on the same tree. And we had a picture of that earlier in the presentation 
which I think is a great thing. In grafting, a branch or bud of one plant is spliced onto another plant. Almost every commercially available fruit tree or rose bush has been grafted. Um, you can tell that a rose has been grafted if you get a, a sucker from that plant and then you notice that it puts out a flower and the flower is a different color. It's probably a, a red color. That's from the root stock and not from what was grafted on top of that. Also, all Japanese maples are grafted onto the root stock of the same hardy stock. So you will see that. When a tree is grafted, you will see a line where the graft was done when it was just a small plant. Graft is long healed over by the time you purchase that, but you will almost always be able to see that line and there will be a difference in the bark texture and color. Rootstock are typically selected for qualities like disease resistance, drought tolerance, and quick growth. And the um, cutting that's spliced to the rootstock is called the scion and it is selected for its fruit or flower qualities. There are many different techniques for cutting and splicing the scion to the root stock, and don't be discouraged if your grafts don't take. The rate of success is low even for good grafters.